Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntris here. This is a great conversation. Uh, came out of the blue, and it's very funny because uh, the creator was on my mind and on a, one of my guests' mind just a few weeks ago. Dan Slott and I were talking about the lack of uh, Jewish heroes, and uh, we were throwing things back and forth. And, of course, we were reminded that the thing uh, was declared as Jewish in Marvel Comics and uh, sanctioned by the publishers, even though it wasn't Stan and Jack's original idea. And uh, the guy who made that happen was Carl Kiesel. And uh, it turns out Carl Kiesel is in the middle of a Kickstarter campaign with uh, his longtime collaborator Tom Grummet on uh, Section Zero. Section Zero is a uh, kind of a Challengers of the Unknown template as far as, you know, and also Fantastic Four, I suppose, in terms of regular human beings uh, facing uh, sci-fi and monster-related uh, mysteries and, uh, you know, uh, c- opponents. And I think it's a great idea for a, a strip. It's something that they started back in the Gorilla comic days uh, in the very late 90s, very early 2000s. And uh, these are the guys that did, you know, Shock Rockets. And uh, uh, that's where Barry Kitson and Mark Wade had uh, Empire, stuff like that. Um, and Busick, of course, did Shock Rockets. And Stuart Immerman was there. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the, the finances behind Gorilla Con- Comics dried up. So they, they put the project on hold and are uh, finally finishing it and would like to uh, continue doing it. And that's the point of the Kickstarter campaign. But this gives me a chance to really uh, reach back into uh, Carl Kiesel's origins and talk to him about his beginnings in comics, uh, going back to the Kubert School and a very impressive graduating class. Uh, not just uh, making Ben Grimm Jewish, but uh, Kiesel is a longtime uh, Kirby acolyte, and I think a lot of his story and uh, you know uh, comic decisions came from uh, what he admired most about Jack Kirby, and I think you hear that a lot in this conversation. Uh, but we talk about the final night, the DC event that he did with Stuart Immerman, and uh, inking John Byrne on Legends, and inking George Perez on History of the DC Universe. Uh, it's it's a really fun look at uh, Carl Kiesel's career. Uh, his other Marvel stuff, we talk about the Captain America fake uh, 1940s uh, newspaper comic strip that he created for Marvel Digital uh, from just a few years ago, among other stories. But a uh, great chance to really uh, pick the mar- brain of Carl Kiesel about what's going on currently and uh, looking back as well. So it's a fun conversation today on Word Balloon. Of course, it's brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, League, for uh, your continued support. Uh, Things are, you know, kind of uh, moving along. I've got some projects in the works, uh, and uh, still uh, things are great at the uh, part-time job at uh, the CBS radio station here in Chicago. I will be on again if you're listening Saturday night from uh, midnight till 6 a.m. and uh, producing during the week as well a couple days. So it helps, and uh, you guys are really helping keeping Word Balloon going. And uh, thank you. If uh, you have the means and uh, think Word Balloon is uh, worth your uh, support beyond listening and have the means to do it, uh, reach me uh, through my front page of wordballoon.com. There's an ad there for Patreon. And uh, if you can spare, I don't know, a dollar a month, uh, the price of a comic book a month, is that too much to ask? If you can help me out, that will really help me uh, produce Word Balloon and uh, keep the show going. Word Balloon is free, and it will always be free. But if you like what I do and would like to help me out, uh, wordballoon.com, click on the Patreon ad, or go directly to patreon.com slash wordballoon. Word Balloon is also brought to you by InStock Trades at InStockTrades.com, where they've got lots of savings going on right now. Marvel and Dark Horse titles are a huge 45% off. Uh, they are also offering damaged books at huge discounts. And I, I have experienced that uh, firsthand when they used to be uh, still in uh, northwest Indiana, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, they've since moved to uh, Nashville. But you'll find some amazing books at very discounted prices if you don't mind a wrinkle or a ding in your book. But uh, you can also get, uh, while supplies last, a uh, last chance sale of 50 to 90% on a list of mostly out-of-print titles. And uh, those are just some of the things. And then, of course, this week, uh, they've got books like uh, Green Arrow Trade Paperback Volume 8, The Hunt for the Red Dragon. That is during the uh, very classic Mike Grell run. This arc is drawn by Rich Hoberg. And, uh, man, I'll tell you, it features Shadow. Uh, you know, I, I'm a huge fan, in particular, of uh, Mike Grell's Green Arrow run because it really, really got interesting, uh, starting with the Longbow Hunters and continuing in the Green Arrow Monthly. If you miss Tony Stark in the armor, 
uh, maybe you missed when it was first coming out. Iron Man, director of S.H.I.E.L.D., the complete collection. Saw that trade paperback on the racks last Wednesday. And, um, man, this is uh, from, uh, I want to say, I'm pretty sure the, uh, God, uh, uh, Danny, he was, it's, it's the Houstons, I believe. I, no, it's not the Houstons. Boy, I'm an idiot. I'm sorry, and it's not on the cover right now. But uh, this is some great uh, Tony Stark as uh, director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, stuff. It runs... Um, 15, uh, issues 15 through 32 and, uh, and an annual as well. Um, it's, it's the Houston, yeah, it is the Houston brothers. It's, or it's Charlie Houston and it's, um, it's not Daniel, but it, or maybe it's the father and son, but you know, they're, they're great TV writers as well. They had a pass on the, uh, powers, uh, pilot as well. Um, but I think, uh, Iron Man was in really good hands. So, uh, you can check out this graphic novel, 472 pages. Jimmy Chung did the, the cover, uh, it is 45% off, $21.99. You can get, uh, did I say the, the price of the Green Arrow one? It's 42% off, eleven fifty nine. if I didn't. Spider-Gwen. Spider-Gwen and Spider-Man sitting in a tree. It's uh, Brian Bendis and Jason Latour. It's the collection of their crossover. Sarah Pacelli uh, doing the art along with Robbie Rodriguez. Uh, 136 pages. And uh, I just had Bendis on the Bendis tapes. And he talked about how much fun this collaboration was. And I know Latour had a good time as well. I haven't had a chance to talk to Sarah or Robbie about it. But uh, this is pretty great stuff, man. And it, it is uh, 45% off, $9.89. Yes, Miles Morales, Canadian girlfriend. But it, it's real this time, as opposed to the lie that uh, I think most 12-year-olds tell each other at summer camp. Uh, pretty cool stuff. From Vertigo, Free Country, A Tale of the Children's Crusade. This is Neil Gaiman, Tony Lift, uh, Peter Gross, Chris Pachalo, and Peter Schneiberg. Um... And uh, this is a two-issue miniseries collected, uh, 42% off. It's just $11.59. Some of the great books on sale this week at InStockTrades.com. Check it out for yourself. Great books at great prices. And don't forget, if your orders are $50 or more, you receive free shipping at InStockTrades.com. Okay, let's go. This was really out of the blue. Carl Kiesel emailed me and said, hey, I'm in the middle of a Kickstarter. Uh, would love to be on and to talk to you about it. And that's great because Carl Kiesel has come up in conversation i think on word balloon cinch since the beginning for me and he's always been one of these creators that i've really admired both as an anchor and a writer and uh, we get tales of both sides of his career so let's join carl kiesel for the first time on word balloon this is a real pleasure finally carl kiesel welcome to word balloon longtime fan and uh i i really appreciated you reaching out and i'm glad we could do this conversation oh i'm more happy than you john thank you so much for having me on I uh, I've I've been a fan of your art and your and your writing and I uh, I'm excited that uh, you and Tom Grummet are uh, bringing back uh, Section Zero, which back in the day was uh, part of Guerrilla Comics and I'm glad you guys are finally getting back to it to uh, to finish the thing. Yeah, well, uh, we've wanted to bring it back uh, almost from the time uh, we had to put it on the shelf and uh, we've come close a few times. You know, we we tried to revive it online in 2012. Uh, that didn't work out for us. Yeah, we did. We actually produced 12 new pages in 2012 and uh, posted them online. And, and, of course, the idea was, you know, every week we would put a couple more pages up. But that is that is not a schedule we could work at, you know, fitting it in around the edges like that. I and, uh, you know, we talked to Image. We talked to IDW. And everyone seemed interested, but we never could quite get the deal to work. And so we went to Kickstarter. Yeah, going directly to the people, and uh, I'm catching you. We're recording Thursday night. I hope to get this out on Friday and spin okay, it fast because well, I see that you've only got 13 days left. Uh, yeah. I but, you know, um, sections – well, let's talk about it, but I'm also curious about Guerrilla Comics and what, what went wrong because, you know, I, I remember it being a, a great imprint and then, you know, things didn't go right. But let's talk about the, the, the book itself. Um, fair to say, a Challengers of the Unknown kind of uh, inspiration? Uh, I think that's very, very, very fair to say. You know, Challengers is probably my favorite idea out there. Uh, I just see so much potential in it. And, you know, obviously I think I think Section Zero sprinkles in a liberal dose of the Fantastic Four, too, because sure. there, are, there are characters in here who have um, certain abilities. Um, and, you know, I, my, my high concept pitch for the book always is Jack Kirby does the X-Files. So, sure. it's, you know, if, if instead of creepy music and uh, flashlights, you know, people were jumping around on X-Files and bursting through doors. That That's kind of what Section Zero is. 
I understand. And uh, well, there's even Doc Challenger, for gosh sake, in the story. Yeah, although you know she um, she uh, uh, is a descendant of Professor Challenger from uh, the Arthur Conan Doyle Lost World story. <laughs> yep, that's awesome. That's fantastic. And of course, you yourself, you've you've uh, had a hand in writing Fantastic Four before. I, I've done a few issues here and there. You know, ba- you know I've, um, I'm kind of like their fi- favorite bridesmaid. Um, <laughs> They, they they turn to me when they need just a few issues filled in be, between all of the the big announcements uh, and and I've been very lucky to to work on some of those runs too. I'm very proud of the work uh, I did with Mike Ringo and Mark Wade on the Fantastic Four. I think it's one of the best runs ever on the book. And I could not agree more. And that's what I was going to ask about. Did you did you ink Mike or did you also come in as a writer in between arcs of theirs? <sighs> I might have written. I know there was, a, there was a few issues in there Mark and I co-wrote that okay. Ringo did not draw. Um, and I, I think I might have written an issue or two before Mark came on, and I certainly wrote an issue or two after Mark left. Um, so, you know, yeah, I, I was just filling in around the edges. Okay. Man, I'll tell you, that run with Mike and Mark, you're right. I mean, I completely agree. In fact, I was even describing, uh, and of course, you know, comic book deaths these days are a dime a dozen, but when... Uh, when you guys killed off uh, Ben, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and you know everyone's kind of mourning, and Sue looks at Reed and it's like you don't seem to be mourning, and he goes, yeah, because we're gonna go to heaven, we're gonna we're gonna get him. Yeah, <laughs> and it was just like what, and it was a great I, story, and because I think probably, um, well, I don't even, uh, you know, it's so funny. I don't know how you feel about it, Carl, but a, a recent movie events made me think of the story, and I don't know if uh, you know you you've already seen uh, the latest. Uh, Marvel movie and and know what I'm talking about. I do not know what you're talking about because I have two very small children, so I get out to see very, very few movies oh, lately. I understand, man. Well, I uh, again, it, that's a great story, and um, and that and and oh, and forgive me because I was just talking to Dan Slott. Ah, oh, Dan. And, great. and are, are we correct that uh, you are the man that uh, kind of revealed in the comics that Ben Grimm is Jewish? Oh yeah, I was. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, I mean. That was based right. uh, on an old Kirby drawing. Jack, he, Jack had drawn Ben uh, with a little prayer shawl and yarmulke. Uh, I'm not sure why he drew it. I, I think I remember it was on some card he sent out or something. Um, and Tom Brevoort and I were just talking. You know, this was one of those. You know, I did I think three fill-in issues in a row, and Tom wanted important stories. And I said, you know, Jack drew Ben as Jewish. Why don't we do that story? That's great. You no, know, um, and, you know, and, and I'm convinced, you know, just personally that uh, at the beginning, you know, Ben was just, you know, a character. But I'm convinced the longer Jack worked on him, the more of himself he put into Ben Grimm. Sure, definitely. you know, and and uh, so uh, yeah, I know Stan Lee has said that they never, you know, intended the character to be Jewish at the start. But, but I, I think by the end, I, bet, I think by the end, he was, you know, clearly, um, you know, a stand-in for Jack himself in so many ways. I, I love that. I think that's fantastic. I remember um, public radio interview, <laughs> interviewing Stan. I don't know where this came from. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good Stan. That's a very good Yeah, well... <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of stories featuring characters he worked on that he he has no idea where those stories came from now. <laughs> but um, but yeah, you know, uh, you know that is the thing. Uh, and and a, Stan only has himself to blame for this. Is you know he started the idea that these characters change and evolve, and Absolutely. that's all we were doing. That's no, all that, we were. That's really cool, man. No, excellent. Well, section zero sounds like a lot of fun, and you've got to preview a few pages on uh, on your Kickstarter page. And, yeah. you know, you and Tom, you guys are pros, you and Tom Grummet, and um, it, it looks great. And I think, again, I, I remember when it was part of Guerrilla Comics. And, you know, tell me a little bit about the background of Guerrilla Comics, because I remember it, and I, 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 do you, I don't know if you alluded to it here in the, uh, in the pitch, but it was, it was weird, because it, it came out around 2000 and fueled by an Internet startup, correct? Uh, you know, uh, I will say I came onto it late. Uh, Kurt... Uh, and Mark were, as, as far as I understood, the real uh, driving forces behind it. Um, Kurt George Busiek was, uh, and, uh, and Mark Wade? Yeah, Kurt, I'm sorry, Kurt Busiek and Mark Wade. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and uh, everything was kind of in place when I, I got brought on board. And um, 
you know, yeah, there was some sort of internet connection and there was supposed to be some financing so that we would get page rates and then that stuff didn't start, didn't quite come together the way people thought it would. Um, and, uh, we all tried to soldier on ourselves and, um, I soldiered on uh, as best I could, uh, until, un- until I got divorced. And, uh, that was, I want to make sh- clear it was of my choosing, but, um, it meant I could no longer work on a book that was not paying me any money. Sure. And, uh, so we, you know, Tom and I, after three issues had to, put it on the shelf and we had the fourth issue over half done. I've got 12, I think 12 pages of finished ink pay, uh, art sitting in my desk that was for issue four that never saw print. Okay. So for this first, is the plan to release it as an OGN? Is that, is that the idea or how yeah. do you, how do you want to do it? Yeah. We're going to collect together the first three issues, um, including the five page preview that is online. Um, then the 12 additional pages Tom and I did in 2012 for, uh, when we tried to revive it online. And, uh, then Tom and I also did a six page section zero story for a, a Canadian charity. I forget the name. And, um, I'm not sure that story ever actually saw print, but we would include that story. And then from there, we need about three issues more worth of story to finish off the story we're telling. So about 60, 66 more pages of new material. And, uh, you know, that'll put us around 150 pages of story in this collected edition. That's cool. That's a nice, that's a nice hefty uh, graphic novel. I think so. I think so. It should be. I, I think it'll be a great package. And, of course, you guys have so many wonderful uh, friends in the business that... Uh, as I think a lot of Kickstarter fans are, are used to and everything, there are uh, rewards that are coming and prints. And uh, apparently, as we uh, before we started recording, you said you, you guys made an announcement today of uh, one of the new uh, artists that are involved. But yeah, give me the give me the st- a string of artists that are helping yeah, you guys well, out. Yeah, um, we've got like some of the most talented and most generous people in the whole world helping us out uh, as far as you know supplying uh, pinups of the characters, illustrations. Um, and and the, there's three different ways that this is happening. Uh, the first way is in the collected edition itself will be uh, 10 pages of pinups. And, you know, I'm, I, I have to say, I don't have the list in front of me, so I can't remember everyone. But we have Walt Simonson. We have Jerry Ordway. We have Chris Somney. We have Dave, Gib- Dave Gibbons. We have Ben Caldwell. We have Kelly Jones and uh, John Polio. Garcia Lopez, a man I actually have never met and cold called and asked if he would do work for, do a pinup for us. He said yes. It was the thrill of my life, believe me. I bet, man. No, and uh, God, I know, uh, you know, with the with the rare exception of Ben Caldwell, know all those uh, guys and they're, they're great people and uh, you got wonderful uh, prints. Yeah, I'm trying to, let's see if I, if uh, you missed anybody. Matthew Clark? Matt Clark, I'm sorry. Yeah, and, Matt Clark. And he's, he's another friend, and of course, uh, your former collaborator, the great Jerry Ordway, as well. That's Jerry. Yeah. Um, who? Uh, yeah. I, I think that's it. Probably, I think did I, Okay. Did we cover everyone? I'm sorry if we missed anyone. That's ten, but, and then the addition yeah. of uh, what your announcement so, today, Adam Hughes. Well, well, but then there's another layer. There, see, those are the ten that will be in the book, the printed book. Oh. Then, there, then there's a reward level, which is the Gorilla Dossier, which is some of the Section Zero characters by the original Guerrilla artists. That's really cool. We have George Perez. George Perez, who... I, listen, I expected... I, when I approached these people, I said, you know, if you guys could draw one or two characters each, I, I'd be really thrilled. You know, Quite honestly, if we got everyone to do two characters, we could cover the main team that way. Okay. And, wow. And, of course, George Perez's first response was, can I draw the whole team? <laughs> And he did. I've already got his pencils. Um, they're they're reproduced in on the Kickstarter page, and uh, so you know George is has a print that will be in the dossier. Uh, Stuart Immerman did two figures already. Excellent. Um, and uh, Barry Kitson is you know is going to draw his soon. He says, and um, the other guerrilla artist, of course, was Mike Raringo who is no longer with us, sadly. Very yeah. sadly. Yeah, yeah, but that's amazing that you actually. Yeah, well, you know. yeah, what I did was I sat there and one day, I can't even tell you how it came into my head, I said, you know, I bet you Mike drew sketches of crypto. And it just so happens in the second half of the book, <laughs> in the second half of the book, we are going to introduce Laika, the Russian space dog, who who did not die horribly in outer space, <laughs> but, but gained superpowers. And now 
is part of Section Zero. Much nicer story, exactly. <laughs> and, and so I found a, a number of sketches Mike had done of crypto because he's a, he was a huge animals fan and animal animal rights uh, fan, and um, contacted the owner of the sketch, explained the situation, and he he gave me permission to to use it. I adapted it slightly, so you know I had to flop over the ears to make it look more like Leica, but um, but this was a way to get. Uh, Ringo involved in the project, That's which um, I I personally was thrilled we could do that. I would agree, absolutely, man. No, you know, Mike. I in fact, I I just had an anniversary for my podcast, and I always say Mike was one of the first creators that really reached out, liked what I was doing, and and really helped me out via email and you know online conversations to kind of say you know hey you know I'm doing this. What do you think? What am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? You're a pro. What what questions are annoying? What you know, the whole went down the whole list of them and stuff. And really, for for months, he was always very, very, very helpful. So, Mike, uh, yeah, Mike, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard stories like that about yeah. Mike. He was an amazing man, amazing you bet, man. man. You bet. It's uh, yeah, we we all miss him. No, he was he was incredible. And again, you you guys you guys knew him better and everything. But I can only tell you, I, I really appreciated what what help he gave me over you know in the early years of Word Malone. But uh, yeah. man. Uh, and then, yeah. Go on, no, please. And, and then I was going to say that then the the very last level of, of guest artist helping us out is uh, the announcement we had today, which is that Adam Hughes is doing a, a print, an 11 by 17 print of the Women of Section Zero, uh, which is its own separate re- reward level all by itself. Very cool. Yeah, man. So, very, very good. No, I've been, I've been, uh, these, these people are very, Talented and extremely generous, and uh, Tom and I have been really blessed by by their generosity. Man, and I'm looking as uh, you know, you go on, and there's some uh, one of a kind kind of uh, original art uh, things. And all right, I see one is sold. Yeah, but uh, yes, yeah, Superboy art, Superboy art is up for sale there. That's excellent, man. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've quite honestly let go of very little of the Superboy art that I inked myself uh, on our second run. I was inking Tom from issue 50 through whatever, you know, most of those issues I inked. And uh, Tom was just drawing the hell out of those pages. I, I looked at him and I'm going, how did I ever ink these? They were so com- – he, he, he was just filling the pages with so much energy and life. And I, I've held on to almost all those pages. But um, this is a project. This Section Zero is a project. Um, I'm willing to part with some of them if it helps make this a reality. That's excellent, man. And I always do forget. Now, it was, it was it you and Tom that were the co-creators of uh, Connell? Yes, we were. Uh, it was, it, you can blame us. And <laughs> um, we, we had a lot of fun on that book, you know, and uh, I would say actually, you know, especially our second run from issue 50 on, where, uh, where our kind of um, mission statement was Jack Kirby does Johnny Quest. Fantastic! That's great, man. There's a there's a good reason to go back in the dollar bins and uh, dig up those issues. That's great. Yeah, I, we just you know, as far as I was con- concerned, it was just pedal to the metal every issue, and it was a blast. It was the most fun I've ever had on monthly comics. It really was. And um, then from from there, Tom and I just said, yeah, we we got to keep this going. And uh, you know, the uh, gorilla thing was kind of put before us. And we decided to to uh, take that plunge and, and put Section Zero on the table. That's great, man. No, I uh, I, I really hope that uh, others will uh, get behind this as well and and uh, help you guys out and, and make this happen because uh, well, and like you too. I mean, I'm a big Kirby fan, and I and I just think that kind of uh, adventurers, you know, uh, dealing with the unknown, I, you know, mortals dealing with the unknown, I think is right. still still pretty viable and everything in the right hands. Yeah, I do too. I mean, quite honestly, uh, whether you're talking Section Zero or Challengers, the, the the thing that the thing that appeals to me so greatly about that is I love the message that you you don't need superpowers to win the day. You just have to be smart. Yep. You have to be determined, and maybe you need a little bit of luck, but you can do it. You yourself can do it. I, I think that's one of the strongest and most helpful messages you can ever have in a story. And that's what I see every time I look at challengers. And that's what I see every time I look at section zero. That's excellent, man. Can I, uh, can I ask you some, uh, origin, uh, stories about, uh, about yourself and everything, how you broke in and all. Yeah, please. So Whatever you want to. Know. I, as I understand, you know what, now I see what your first work was as far as uh, published work, new talent showcase, uh, back yeah. in April of 84. But, but prior to that, what led you to, uh, 
pitching to D.C.? What kind of art school or any sort of background did you have before getting your break? Well, um, I knew from very early on, from about 10 years old, I wanted to be a cartoonist. Uh, and, and I can't really remember the moment that happened. It just happened so young in my life. And I just kind of pursued that pretty uh, single-mindedly. I did, uh, after graduating high school in 77, I went to the Joe Kubert School uh, for one year. It was a two-year program at the time. Okay. I, would have been in, I would have been in the second graduating class. Wow. Uh, Who I was, Tell I, me some of the teachers beyond Joe. That were teaching well, back then. Well, there was uh, Dick Ayers, High Eisman. Um, we had uh, Kelly. What was Kelly's last name? I forget. She was our production. She she was. Oh, I can't remember her last name. I'm so sorry. And she was a great teacher. Uh, Leah Lot. Le- not Leah Elias. I can't remember some of the other people. That's Those okay. are the ones that stick in my head. Okay. Okay. But, but I mean, well, I was in the same class with Jan Dersima and T- Tom Mandrake and Ron Randall and uh, John Tottlebin. Wow. All of them. It, Holy cow. It was a great class. It yeah. was a great class. Yeah. And, um, and I mean, there was a lot of, uh, you know, Dave Dorman. He was there. Oh, great. Sure. Yeah. It, Chicago's it very was own. A, I know Dave. Absolutely. Yeah. Dave's a great guy. <laughs> Dave's a great guy. And, um, but anyways, the thing is, is I was at the Joe, the Joe Kubert school and I saw people who were, you know, I came from a small town in upstate New York and I thought I was, I was pretty hot. <laughs> and I went to this school and I said, oh, my God, these guys are a lot better than me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I remember seeing John Tottleman. One of the first days I was at the school, he took a piece, piece of paper, 11 by 17, and he literally, with his pencil, drew a large shape of, the, of an S, a large S. It took up most of the page and just very simple, quick S. That was all he did with pencil. Then he took his brush, put in the ink and drew a Frazetta style sea monster. Based on that S. <laughs> it was like just pouring out of his fingers. I was, it was, un, it was inconceivable to me. And, um, and so I actually decided during that year, I was not cut out to be a cartoonist that, uh, that I didn't have what it took. And so I went from there to the uh, Hartford art school in Hartford, Connecticut to uh, just kind of figure out what else to do with my life. And while I was there, I decided, you know, it really is cartooning. That's really what I want to do. And uh, so after I, g- I got done with the Hartford Art School, I moved to New York City uh, with, with a college friend. And uh, I worked in a small typesetting shop during the day and ink samples at night until, you know, DC put me in their new talent program. Wow. So on that first new talent showcase book, what uh, was it a, a recognizable DC character that you worked on? Oh, oh no! The the new talent stuff was all new characters uh, created by by the new writers. You know, um, oh, I know. I see. I, okay, so it was purely new concept, new artists, everything. Yeah, I inked. Uh, I think the I think the very first thing I inked for them was a, a story called Bobcat, which was you know about a young boy who put on a ski mask and called himself Bobcat and and had adventures like in his suburban backyard i mean there was absolutely nothing superheroic about it um it was penciled by stan walk and uh who was also in the new talent program at the time um and uh i also think terry shoemaker on new talent showcase before then we both got our bump up to tales of the legion of superheroes that was my first ongoing monthly gig at, at dc very cool absolutely and uh who were some of you know who were, were they were those solo stories of the legionnaires uh some of them were solo. Some of them were, you know, connected month to month. That was during that short time when they had, they were doing hardcover, soft cover comics where like the, they, they, the Baxter paper editions and the, yes. and the newsprint editions. And so I was on the newsprint edition. The Tales of Legion was was a one year job, and at the end of the year they were going to start print, reprinting the Baxter editions. Right, a year later, that was the whole idea. Okay, that, that obviously didn't last very long. So yeah, that's interesting. So were you a separate anchor? on the same material that was appearing in the Baxter stuff? Is that how that worked? No, 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 no. There, there were two, for a year, there was actually two separate Legion books. And, and I think they did it with Titans, too, didn't they? Yes, they did. Two, okay, and I wasn't sure if there was two different products, because yeah. as you say, you know, I do kind of remember that uh, period where, yeah, you know, the, the specialty stories had the Baxter edition, and also likely the news, newsprint edition as well. Another one, too, well, actually, I don't remember if the uh, Outsiders did both as well. I, you know, I just don't remember. I just don't remember. But yeah, it's, so, yeah, those, like those three books come to mind and yeah. So, okay. Uh, but I, yeah, the idea was that 
both books would have new material for a year, but at the end of the year, the newsprint edition would just start reprinting a year later what had appeared in the Baxter edition of the book. That's crazy, man. And uh, yeah, it, that didn't really work out. <laughs> so who uh, who was uh, was it uh, was Keith writing that or Paul Levitz? Keith Giffen or Paul Levitz writing that? Do you remember? Paul, Paul Levitz probably was writing it, if I remember correctly. There was uh, uh, an arc in Tales of the Legion that was written by Mindy Newell, who had also come out of the New Talent sure. program. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, and, and in fact, you know, Terry Shoemaker was only around for six of the 12 issues. And then this new Turk came on the book called, uh, whose name was Dan Jurgens. Never heard of him. Yeah. Never heard of him. <laughs> Dan's awesome. I just saw Dan at uh, C2E2 in Chicago. Yeah, no, Dan's, Dan's a great guy. Yeah, Dan's a great Dan. guy. No, Dan's amazing. Absolutely. Well, and you guys have a long history as well on uh, on Superman and stuff. I am amazed at some of the things you worked on. I'm looking at, and forgive me, of course, leaning on uh, every seventh grader's friend, Wikipedia. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. But I'm hoping these credits are right. <laughs> this is really cool. So you did Amazing Man? Yeah, I did. I was thinking uh, Stephen DiStefano and Amazing Man. That was a great, great time. You know, Stephen is probably one of the most flat-out creative people I've ever met in my life. That's cool. What made his style special uh, working with Well, him? it was special because it was totally unique. There was no one else in, in mainstream comics that drew like Stephen. Very true. You know, Steve, Stephen was drawing his inspiration from Billy DeBeck and Rube Goldberg and some very old-school classic cartoonists, some real slapstick um, cartoonists that uh, – you know, at the time, no one else was drawing like that, you know? Did you study that old stuff as well to kind of get the feel for what he was trying to do? To a certain degree, yeah. I mean, I love that stuff, too. I mean, I'm a huge fan of the old comic strips. And um, whether they're mostly adventure, but I do also love, you know, the Billy DeBeck stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, like uh, George McManus's Bring Up Father, very different stylistically. Absolutely, but that's really beautiful. cool. Yeah, you know, you must you must love what IDW does when they when they re-release all the great uh, comic strips material. Yeah, you know, ID, IDW is the company that basically is making me bankrupt. <laughs> so <laughs> between between the the you know the American comic comic library whatever it's called, yes, which I get far too many of, and then the artist editions. I mean, really, oh, yeah. they, I should just send them my paychecks every month. <laughs> you know. I know exactly what you mean, man. No, IDW, they're they're wonderful people, and uh, and really, I'm so glad. And uh, you know, Somni, of course, helping you out as well with Section Zero and a print. Yes. Uh, Chris and I yeah. always talk about uh, the old adventure strips, and and you know, the and I discovered them like Chris did. I mean, you know, in some, I mean, again, we're not we're not too far in age as we were discussing earlier in the in, before we started yeah. recording. But uh, yeah, man, I mean, really. That that wonderful golden age of adventure strips, and yes, it's easy to talk about Kniff and uh, you know uh, Rick Kirby, and I'm blanking right now. Is that uh, that's not Alex Raymond? Who is it? Uh, yeah, isn't it Alex Raymond? I, I, I thought I, it was Alex Raymond. I'm, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. I, I, I might be wrong because I actually am not a huge fan of Rip Kirby, but um, but it, I think it's Alex Raymond. Tell me, tell me your adventure strip uh, favorites. Oh well, it's Kniff is my very very sure. favorite. There's no doubt about it. He uh, reading Kniff the, and I was exposed to his stuff that year I was at the Kubert School because um, Nostalgia Press had come out with a number of collections and sure. uh, yes, they they had they had what three four volumes of of the Kniff Terry and uh, the one volume called Meet Burma. Yes, it, it it changed my life reading that book. Wow, because. You know, it, it had beautiful, sassy, sexy women in it, and the, the art was astounding, and there were no superpowers. Quite honestly, I did not understand that comics, gripping comics could be done without costumes, and uh, that really opened up my eyes to, uh, you know, a whole new way of uh, telling stories and the possibilities of stories, and it sounds so obvious and trite today but it was a life-changing moment for me to read those kind of stories totally and also um those hardcovers was it bill black yeah bill blackbeard black it was blackbeard press yeah, or I something think it was like blackbeard press or whatever or... Yeah, yeah but i think you're right bill black yeah yeah those things uh i remember those coming out in bookstores and again yeah. like you say it's it sounds silly to say it but graphic novels were really rare back then. There were really only a, a handful of things like Jules Pfeiffer's History of Comics and yeah, you know yeah. uh, ch really Charles Schultz Peanuts collections and things like that. Uh, yeah, you know, and as you say, Nostalgia Press would would come out with this stuff, and it was just mind blowing 
Um, I'll give you one of my favorites too, uh, uh, Johnny Hazard. Uh, he was second on my list. He was Hazard. second on my list. <laughs> I don't play it. I love I love Johnny Hazard. I, I just love that stuff that um that uh, Frank Robbins did. It's yes. just astounding. It's astounding. I actually also have a a, a real fondness for uh, you know some some of the wackier strips. I really like the old Wonder Woman comic strip. Um, it's just so biz- bizarre sometimes. I never. The art- I don't think so, I ever read it. Who uh, who was writing and drawing it back then? Well, theoretically, you know the the um, same people doing the comic book. Well, I can't tell you if it was ghosted or not, but it had the same look of the '40s comic. Okay, okay. Or you know, or a really weird strip like Invisible Scarlet O'Neill. Yes. Uh, you know about about a reporter who could turn invisible, and th- that sounds like a great uh, a great power to give a character in a comic strip because then you don't have to draw her. You know, <laughs> and. Saves a lot of time when you don't have to draw. But I mean, I love the Dick Tracy stuff. Yep. I love, um, you know, what else am I getting? Oh, I, I am also getting the uh, the Drawn and Quarterly um, Gasoline Alley, Walton Skeezix oh, books, cool. which are just yeah. gorgeous, you know. And Chris Ware, I believe, is putting those together, and they're clearly a labor of love. Oh, I didn't realize he was doing that. That's really cool. Yeah. One of their volumes actually came with a DVD, which included um, home movies that Frank King took of his family. Wow. It's amazing what they're, they're putting in these. Yeah, finding the so inspiration. I, yeah, I, you know, I, I just love all of that stuff. All of that stuff. That's really amazing, man. All right, now back to your career because uh, I uh, – so you, as you said, you were doing Tales of the Legion. And uh, I had no idea you inked, you inked over George Perez on the history of the DC Universe, that wonderful yeah. prestige format that was out post-crisis and kind of – yeah. Set the new uh, lay of the land from uh, the creation of the universe on to the modern age. Yeah, no, that was a, a huge break for me. Probably my very first big break. That, uh, and then you know the legends, uh, Ink and John Byrne. Yes. That was that. Those things, you know, once again, those were life changing moments as far as my career goes. We, I mean, you know, both of them obviously were big names on on the books back then. When you when you reached that level of inking, was it kind of like holy shit? Look what I'm doing right now. Yeah, no, it was. It was pretty astounding. I still remember the first time John Byrne called me to say he liked what I was doing. I was like, it was like meeting the Beatles, or, you sure. know, talking to Elvis Presley. You know what I mean? <laughs> sure. And uh, so, and George, of, George Perez is like a big teddy bear. He's the nicest guy in the whole world. Um, you know, I. Uh, so it was great. It was always a joy to work with George. It always is. That's amazing, man. So one line to. Um, I, I, and I know too that the, another key uh, miniseries that you had uh, an interesting uh, team up as well. Uh, you, your wife Barbara at the time, and mm-hmm. uh, and Rob Liefeld doing Hawk and Dove back in 1988. Yeah, yeah, that that actually came out of uh, you know the history of the DC universe because when I was inking that, it was when I was inking the page about the crisis, and there was a, a little montage of the uh, dead heroes, and I was inking the dead Dove character, and I was thinking, yeah, Dove. That really should have been a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and the pieces just started to fall in place. And, uh, yeah, we 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 got DC interested. And uh, Mike Carlin uh, was the editor. And I believe Barbara is the one who brought in this young Turk named Rob Liefeld. And, um, yeah, we it was it was, you know, it, it just was a lot of the right people in the right place at the right time. It came together great. It's it's still a miniseries I'm very proud of. I don't blame you. No, I understand. I remember when Rob went back to uh, the characters a few years ago, and uh, I had him on to talk about uh, coming back to that and all. Um, so, how did uh, did you and Barbara both join the Superman family at the same time in terms of writing uh-huh. and, and making uh, art for them? Well, Barbara was an editor up there. Okay, she, was she, and you know, forgive me because was it Louise that uh, like what like who who all were writing? Uh, the Superman stuff that led to the reign of the Superman and that and that whole situation. Oh, well, let's see. Uh, before before I came on the book, Louise, Weezy Simonson was writing Man of Steel with John Bogdanov uh, on art. Dan was writing and drawing Superman. Right. Uh, Action was written by uh, Roger Stern, and I believe drawn by Jackson Geis at that point. Still, that sounds right. And, and then Adventures of Superman was written by Jerry Ordway. Penciled by Tom Grummet, and then they killed Superman, and Jerry decided he'd kind of said what he had to say with the character, and then Carlin called me up and asked if I wanted to come on board. That's great, man. 
That's really, that really is, cool. So was the Hawk and Dove thing the first thing that you wrote uh, professionally? Yeah. Yeah, I wrote that, you know, co-wrote it with, with Barbara, right. and uh, from there it actually did get its own monthly series, which we co-wrote. Um, and uh, But I got my first solo writing chance uh, by, in uh, Secret Origins. Uh, there, was a, there was an editor there named Mark Wade. He was <laughs> editing Secret Origins, and he gave me a chance to solo write a, a, a Newsboy Legion story. Oh, fantastic. I love the Newsboy Legion. That's great, man. And, yeah, so I that was my I believe that was my first solo writing credit, and in fact I, I wrote it, penciled it, and inked it. I did all of it myself, and uh, that was I'm so very proud of that story too. And um, but I but I think, you know, that was the first time people saw me as 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 um, a writer in my own right. Uh, you know, and uh, that uh, I believe it was not long after that that uh, Carlin gave me the call about Superman. That's really cool. And I want to st- stop for a second on the Newsboy Legion because there's another great team, another great Kirby team. And uh, that whole phenomenon back in the Golden Age when these boy gang books were so, so you know important. And it, make, it makes complete sense because it really did speak to the core audience back then. We're yes, really that sure, sure, 10 sure. years old, you know, to, to teen, you know, teen years and stuff. And so, yeah, it makes sense. And again, think of the movies that were coming out back then, the, the dead end kids and uh, yeah. even, even our gang and stuff like that. But, you know, so yeah, it kind of made sense, but really boys ranch, boys, Canandos, newsboy, yeah. Legion, all of that stuff. And that it was all Simon and Kirby ideas and, and how massively huge they were. Yeah, I know. It, it's, it's a, it's a really, it's a genre that's um, virtually disappeared nowadays. I mean, I think actually the most, the closest you can come to that now uh, is Paper Girls, you know. That's fantastic. I like Because that Paper connection. Girls is, is kind of like the Newsboy Legion if they were all girls. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's part of me that's convinced, because uh, that's written by, by Brian Vaughn, right? Yeah, Brian K. Vaughn, that's right. Yes, yeah, Brian K. Vaughn. Vaughn. Uh, there, there's Look part of me that's convinced that he took a Newsboy Legion idea that was in his head. And this is just me. Sure. This is just me. No, but it's, I love that. That's a great a theory. More, it probably says a lot more about me than it says about him. <laughs> but, I, but I'm convinced he had this idea for a Newsboy Legion story for DC and then just said, I'll just do it on my own and make them all girls. And it, you know, I, 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 that's one of the best comics out there, I think. I just love Paper Oh, girls. no, it's a really cool comic. But, you know, it's funny. I was talking to John Miller, and John uh, has a blog about uh, goofy superheroes and supervillains, and then also uh, he's uh, written two books collecting some of the great ideas, really through the decades, because he even goes to the 2000s for some crazy ideas. And uh, one in particular was that period when Joe Simon, and I always forget, uh, Grandinetti. Uh, yeah, Grandinetti. Yeah. Grandinetti, okay, yeah. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, what the stuff they came up with in the 70s in particular, some of their weird ideas. And they yeah, had like their, the, their weird outsiders, but also the green team. The green team. I love the green team. <laughs> Me the team too. that believes money can solve every problem. <laughs> I love that. Absolutely, one of those great weird first issue specials, and really a throwback to those boys, you know, voice ranch and voice commandos kind of ideas, but with money. You know, I have to say there was an issue. I don't remember what issue, but there was an issue of Adventures of Superman that I wrote that Stuart Immerman drew, so it was drawn beautifully, and it teamed up the Newsboys, the Green Team, and the Dingbats of Danger Street. Nice. Wow. <laughs> That's impressive, and also just. I had no idea once, you know, their the Green Team series ended with that uh, DC, you know, those two issues of DC uh, right. Cavalcade or what, what were they called? The it was first, first issue special. I think that's what that was in. First issue special. Yeah, but I'm thinking of the two issues that really were just ash cans that they. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. Yeah, I think you're right. The Cavalcade of Cancelled Comics. Yes, yeah, those exactly, and they they just kind of stuffed it with inventory. Stuff and right. everything, the thing, things that weren't going to see the light of day. And I know, like, the last Green Team story was in that, but apparently not because you guys worked on that. And I'm glad you mentioned Stuart because I also want to acknowledge uh, the Final Night series that you guys did together. Well, thank you. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's so that's a big event and everything that you got to do. Yeah, that was, you know, you know, obviously events are still big, but that was, I remember once talking to Dan Jurgens, uh, probably ra- shortly before, you know, Stuart and I did Final Night, and Dan said at the time, he goes, 
comics are heading towards event publishing. And, you know, Dan, Dan understands the business much better than I do. There's no doubt about it. And, uh, and he, he was right. Event publishing is how the business works nowadays. Yeah. Uh, for better or worse. I mean, you know, and again, I, and there are, Hey, I'm, and I'll tell you right now, I'm enjoying uh, secret, uh, secret empire, uh, the new captain America story. And I want to get to your, uh, interesting, uh, digital captain America's experience in, in a bit as well. But uh, we're glossing over uh, Reign of the Supermen. So, you know, yeah, coming up with uh, Connell. I mean, you know, so was this, you know, was the character created by committee? I mean, you know, tell me about this idea. I mean, it's it's such a great idea. First of all, killing Superman really was such a huge moment in comics. And, and I think a bold decision that I wonder if today's Internet would tolerate, given the amount of pushback that the audience <laughs> give, yeah. gives these days, just when they hear the solicits for a story, let alone maybe read, you know, I mean, I, I don't know yeah. what, what the, do you, do you think about that? What the response might've been if, if no. you know, we've yeah. seen Doomsday beat Superman to death? I, no, I, I have to say, I've never even thought of how it might play <laughs> in today's marketplace. I mean, it just, it, it was, you know, such a perfect storm, you know, when it happened, no one expected that. No one expected that sort of reaction. I mean, I don't think Jerry would have left Superman if he knew that what was coming. Um, <laughs> yeah, and that's true. I, you know, I mean, when when I was considering coming on Superman, there was the promise of, you know, yeah, you're going to get maybe a couple hundred bucks a month in royalties. It's, you know, selling solid, you know. So that that was like the numbers I was working with. And, um, but, uh, but I mean, you, I, no one could see that coming and, uh, I don't know how it would be dealt with today. I just don't know. Well, let's talk about that, that, you know, uh, behind the scenes when, when you guys were putting this together, because really Dan has been the one guy that I have been able to get to talk to about this. And I'm sure everybody else would, it was really interesting for a while. And I will say this publicly. Um, I tried really hard because I had met Mike Carlin, at a couple of San Diego Comic Con dinners, friends of friends and really nice. And I'm like, hey man, I'd love to talk. And it was around the time of the 20th anniversary of of the story. It was about 2013. And I'm like, hey, come on, I'd love to hear the you know creation of the death of Superman and the reign of Superman. What an important story. And he's like, you know, if, he goes, I'm technically working for animation, you know, now. So as long as everybody says it's okay, you know, I just can't do it on my own. I said, all right, no problem. And I asked Warner uh, PR, and they're like, no. And I'm like, why? And at first it was because we said so. And I knew enough people. I'm like, no, no, no. And I called up the, the PR people that I knew back then. I'm like, come on. And they're like, well, you know, he's animation and the bosses are saying they only want him to talk about new stuff. And I'm like, but he did all these like video interviews for years. They're all over YouTube. It's, it's, it's a 20 year old story. Come on. And I go, I'm sure you guys are going to be reprinting stuff. Sorry, man. They're saying no. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> you know, yeah. So. Yeah. So what can you well, tell me? <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to spoil any bad I'm jobs under, for you, but yeah, tell me what you can about. Yeah, I'm, I'm under no similar restrictions, right, but <laughs> yeah, and I don't. You know, I I can't even begin to guess why the PR people said that. Oh, but, and I'm not worried about that. But no, tell me about like you know, in terms of creating the four. You know, John John Henry Irons and uh, the Eradicator as as the Kryptonian and Cyborg Superman, and uh, of course uh, everyone's uh, little favorite punk. Yeah. The, the kid with a yeah. lot of uh, personality, Connell. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it, you know, as far as I remember it, the you know, we had all been asked to come up with ideas for how to bring Superman back, and I had written up a number of different ideas, but uh, but one of the ideas, and I'm not saying I'm the man who thought of this idea, but one of the, the ideas I wrote down was that each of the books have a different Superman. And when I got to this to the summit. Before we even walked in, Carlin was saying that was going to happen. And I'm not saying I suggested the story. I'm saying great minds were thinking a lot. Sure, really... Absolutely. People are thinking along yeah. the same lines, of course. And um, in in my in my little write ups of ideas, you know, I had I had assumed if we were going to do four Supermen, I was saying, well, we should we should have each of the Supermen somehow reflect the book that they're in and. And so, you know, in my mind, uh, Man of Steel, I guess maybe that's a, a Superman robot. Yeah, yeah, there's Superman robots. Yeah, that could be, a, you know, and, and I thought action comics. Well, you know, that should be a Siegel and Schuster Superman, a guy that, you know, leaps an eighth of a mile and a bursting shell can, can hurt him, you know, that sort of thing. 
And I, I figured Superman would have the real Superman in it. And uh, quite honestly, I had been stuck for the longest time about what, you know, I would put in Adventures of Superman, the book I was going to be working on. And I was going, Adventures of Superman, what? And, and you know, then it hit me, the Adventures of Superman when he was a boy. And because that was the old tagline of Superboy. Of course, yes. And, and so that's when I said, well, Superboy, Superboy could be in Adventures of Superman. And uh, so we all went into the summit, and one of the first things we started to do was just spitball different kinds of Superman that could appear in the different books. And, you know, Alien was written down, and Ray Robot, and Walk-In Spirit, and all, all sorts of different things were written down. And I will have to say, Dennis Jenke, inker on Man of Steel, is the one who said out loud, Superboy. And it got written down on the board. And uh, then as we started uh, um, divvying things up, I, I had mentioned that I thought, a Superboy could be a clone of Superman, and that maybe it could involve Project Cadmus. Excellent. And that had been received really well. And so when it came time to divvy it up, I, I, I had had a history with Cadmus because I had done some Newsboy backups in Adventures of Superman, in, in Jerry's Adventures of Superman, and I had done the Secret Origin story and stuff. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, I've got a lot of experience with Cadmus, and if Superboy is going to be from Cadmus, you know, and... Um, I was kind of, you know, Dennis had put that idea on the table, so really Man of Steel had prior claim to it. And Wheezy Simonson is the one who said, if you want Superboy, you can have Superboy. She was very, very generous and kind. That's great. It, it, was, it was a moment that I'm sure, you know, one of many, but it was a moment that really dictated a lot of my coming years, obviously. Absolutely. And, and yeah, like, like you said, the, sa the sales were ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. But um, as far as, you know, other, th you know, once Superboy was decided on, his personality and um, look was, was really left up to Tom and I. Tom almost instantly designed Superboy sitting at the summit, as I remember. Uh, and uh, his design was used almost unchanged. The only thing that I remember was changed was uh, Tom originally gave Superboy uh, a spikier hairstyle and <laughs> Carlin is the one that said, give him the Superman S curl, spit curl. <laughs> and, uh, you know, other than that, what you saw is what Tom designed, you know, on a piece of paper at the Superman summit. And uh, oddly enough, it's very strange. Uh, a number of years later, I was digging through some of my old papers and I found a uh, pitch I had given to Karen Berger when I was inking Legion of Superheroes because um, Terry Shoemaker was the penciler. I love Terry's work. I wanted to continue working with him. And Terry wanted to go do something else. He only lasted six issues on Legion of Superheroes. And so I put together an idea based on um, the idea that Terry really wanted to draw cars. He really liked cars and he wanted to draw something that involved cars a lot. And so I came up with this idea about a, a 1950s kid who did, you know, street racing in his car and, um, one day, basically, a UFO crashes and he puts parts of the UFO into his car and now his car can do strange things. <laughs> but anyways, I read over this proposal a few years after working on Superboy and the main character in that book, at the time I was going to call it Johnny Rocket, although I know now that there's a chain of restaurants called that. And was it, oh no, Johnny Comet was Frazetta. Johnny Comet. Sure, yeah, was, yeah, but I was going to call it Johnny I'm Rocket. Okay. And, uh, but anyways, Johnny, in that proposal, was exactly Superboy. I was reading his personality, and I'm going, oh, my God, I stole my own idea for Superboy. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, obviously, for whatever reason, it was a sort of character that appealed to me and had been in my head for quite a while. It was great because, you know, and also Tana Moon, the creation. Tell me about Tana Moon, his girlfriend. Well, we just wanted... Um, we, we, we kind of wanted to play around with some of the um, archetypal uh, situations in the Superman comics. Sure. So we wanted to, him to have a relationship with a reporter. And um, but it, but we didn't want it the normal relationship. We were, we were you know playing around a little bit with the idea of celebrity and and, um, you know, people who were not necessarily being as upfront as they should be, you know. Um, and, you know, it was just giving a different spin on that sort of relationship. Um, you know, Superboy was a, was a, a character who, who thought he was a lot smarter and worldly than he really was. <laughs> um, yeah. 
you know, and and uh, I you know I do think uh, I've always said he had, he had the arrogance of youth. You know, I, I thought I I thought I knew a lot more when I was seventeen than I think I know now. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, know, I know exactly what you mean. Absolutely. <laughs> no, he had it was that was the thing. It was, but it was, you know, a, a, a smart ass is a, is a hell of a tightrope to walk as a writer for a smart ass, and he could either be a jerk like Jason Todd in, inadvertently became. Or he could yeah. be, you know, a, a guy that you kind of liked, and and you know there were, I think there were peaks and valleys in terms of Connell's appeal, and I know, but I know initially it was fun watching this kid kind of, you know, come in with swagger, and also too just playing with Lois as he did, and part of the mystery of could this could the essence of Superman be in this young boy, you know? Right, right. Yeah, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely, man. No, that was a great series. So then you had two runs on him. So how long did the first run uh, last? About thirty issues. Uh, b- both wow. of my yeah, it was right around issue thirty that um, I, I kind of played out what I had in my head for Superboy at that point, and uh, and uh, so I took uh, you know I, I, I stepped away, and it was about eighteen issues later that suddenly, you know, I had another idea. And and I heard at that point that Ron Mars, who'd taken over for me on Superboy, was thinking of moving on. And uh, for some reason, you know, the idea, like I said, uh, before Jack Kirby does Johnny Quest just clicked in my head and I said, that's what I want to do with Superboy. Um, and, and I will actually, actually tell you there's another part of why I came back to Superboy. Um, and, you know, I did. I campaigned to get the job back. I really went after it. Is... Um, it, it goes back to, uh, if you might remember, the Amalgam comics. And yes. there was a co- comic book called Spider Boy. Certainly. That, that I wrote and Mike Waringo penciled. Wow, I totally forgot you guys worked on that together. Go on, please. Yeah. But, I, I you know, that, that assignment was, you know, just one of those quirky, weird assignments <laughs> that come your way. And I started working on it, and I was having so damn much fun on Spider Boy. It was the most fun I ever had on a comic. And I just said, why am I not doing this, this sort of comic every single month? Why am I not having this much fun every single month? And that led somehow in my own head to that Jack Kirby does Johnny quest idea and linking it up with Superboy. And, and so that's what we tried to do. We tried to bring that sort of high energy, um, thrill ride to Superboy. Did he have adult mentors in the way that Johnny Quest did? Well, kind of. There were adults around him. Um, I mean, I can't say there was an exact an- analog to the characters by any means. Okay. I mean, I, you know, I, I guess in some level you could say Guardian uh, was his race band. I, but now, I wondered if, if Guardian played a, a more prominent role in your second run. Well, in the second run, the first run he was in Hawaii. Uh, but the second run, he was uh, housed right in Project Cadmus. And so Guardian was there. And uh, we actually moved the Newsboy Legion out because th- there was a lot of characters. And sure. we had to stream- streamline things. You know, but we did keep Double X around. He was, he's always been a really fun character yeah, I'm a to big, play I'm with. I'm a big Double X fan. Did you hear? Yeah. I'm sure you did. The, that BBC uh, adaptation of uh, the, the, death of, uh, the Death and Life of Superman, I think is what they called it. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. I didn't hear really. It oh man, they um, because and I'm trying to remember who I talked to about that. It might have been uh, Chuck Dixon because I know they did Nightfall as well with Bane uh, right, and everything. Right. But uh, yeah, it was pretty. It was they they made a, a book on tape of it that was. I know there were audio cassettes of it, but it was a fully produced radio style drama. Of, wow. Uh, yeah, and and I remember uh, they man they included everything. They certainly had Superboy in there and Double X and Guardian. And uh, and Cadmus and everything. The, the Newsboy Le- Legion didn't make it in there, but uh, yeah, they did a they did a pretty. Uh, uh, it's it's good. It's 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 pretty interesting. They did those stories, and they also did uh, Kingdom Come. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Pretty 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 interesting. But um, no, that's awesome, man. And yeah, I uh, I, I did read that that uh, first run of yours of uh, Superboy, and then I drifted away for comics. For a while, in, including, I'm sorry to say, I finally ended up rereading it, or I guess not rereading it, but reading it after it was it came out. But the final night, uh, I kind of came to that a, a couple years later because I didn't come back to comics till about '98 or '99. And, right, right. And uh, and yeah, so I mean, was that you know uh, again? I mean, you had Stewart on, and I've I've had Stewart on, and uh, I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Stewart's uh, both personally and professionally. Um, 
you know, are they, uh, you know, is, is Final Night still, you know, regarded well and everything? I know that, you know, there are big moments in that. Hal Jordan, doesn't he sacrifice himself to reignite the, uh, the sun? Not to spoil, but he does. it was, he does. That's, that's 20 years ago, so that's all right. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I think that's, I think that's old news now, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I mean, I have very fond memories of that, uh, miniseries. I think it was a really interesting miniseries. Um, and, a big point of the miniseries was um, the redemption of Hal Jordan. There's no doubt about it. Very cool. And I, then your your world's finest. Now I'm I bet I'm getting that confused with Burns Generations. Um, maybe. I mean, I did a world's finest, which uh, was was conceived editorially. I was I, I was given a call uh, from someone at DC. It might have been Jordan Gorfinkel. Might have been him. And he said they had this idea that they wanted to do a a 12-issue World's Finest series where each issue was set a year apart. And um, it showed the uh, evolution of the relationship of Batman and Superman over a number of years. So, I mean, that was the concept that was placed in my lap. and, And then I figured out the different beats, what would be happening year by year, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we came up with the World's Finest series, which um, which was a lot of fun. I thought we did some really good things there. That's cool. And who was the artist on there? Um, we had a number of artists, and now I'm blanking. Oh, I mean, okay. It was, and maybe, you know, because it was 10 issues, it's, it's a bunch of guest it started artists. As, it started as one artist, and I, oh, boy, I, I feel I feel like a heel because I can't remember oh, man. the name. It's, you know. it's, right on, it's right on the tip of my tongue, too. But... Um, 17 for, years ago, what, dude. It's, uh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but for whatever reason, he uh, unfortunately couldn't keep up with the deadline, and so we had to bring in a number of um, of fill-in artists, uh, especially in the second half of the run. I see. Okay. So, um, but I mean, I think we did some, I, I know we did a, you know, I always tried to find different parts of uh, the uh, mythos, to, the tube mythos, Bat, Bat and Superman and mythos to play off each other. And uh, I know we did, like, an, an issue that had uh, Batgirl, who was kind of like the brightest spot in Gotham, and she met Thorn, who's kind of the darkest spot in Metropolis. You know, because so, you know, Metropolis is generally a very bright, hopeful sure. city, but it's got Thorn running around in it, who's really a very um, noir character. Big fan of Thorn. <laughs> Going back to the Lois Lane backup days, absolutely. Yeah, awesome. all those, those were amazing. Yeah, really and, cutting uh, edge yeah. for its day. Absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think we did some fun things like that. I know we did an issue of um, Mix Pitalix meets Batmite, you know, that sort of stuff. Sure. And, um, you know, I just, I, you know, uh, probably my very favorite uh, issue, though, was um, was the one where we played off the, uh, you know, Superman is uh, had just killed some people, you know, in, in his timeline. He had, he had murdered some of the Kryptonians. And at the same time, when you look at the comics, at the same time, that's when uh, – uh, Jason Todd had died over in the Batman books, mm-hmm. and so you had these two characters who were who were really you know grappling with the idea of, of death and mortality, and and uh, that whole issue took place in uh, Smallville, and uh, I think it's probably my favorite issue of the whole run. That's cool. That sounds great. Have they collected that? Yes, they have. Um, you know, I, I I think it's just a trade paperback. I don't think there's any fancy schmancy collection, but there is a <laughs> trade. Trade paperback, yeah. That's cool. I'm gonna have to find that. That's that sounds great, man. And uh, and I, you know, oh, and I also I'm curious because you know, I and it's so funny. I, I always forget sometimes. I had uh, Paul Dini on at the end of the year last year, and we talked a bit about you know, God. I mean, the one bright thing, and I'll and I'll be honest, not crazy about the Suicide Squad, Squad film, but that said, okay. the one thing they did get right was Harley Quinn. Uh, no, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. yeah, and and really, what do you what do you think of as someone who's you know, spent time. You and Terry Dotson had a Harley Quinn run, and I, you yeah. know, have, uh, as as one of her, you know, creative fathers and everything. What, what do you think of the year of Harley that uh, was 2016? Well, you know, I mean, I, I I certainly understand the appeal of Harley. She's an extremely engaging character. Um, I really enjoyed working on that book. Uh, in all honesty, it was not my choice to leave the book. It was an editorial decision. Um, and uh, I am I am thrilled that she is as popular as she is because she really deserves it. Um, it's she, she's just a really hopeful character, even though 
technically she's crazy and all that. I mean, they, they certainly are certainly are working around that nowadays, which is good. I mean, I'm glad they got her out of the relationship with Joker and stuff like that. You know, um, I've talked to I've talked to um, Jimmy uh, Palmiotti and Amanda about this, Amanda Connor, uh, and their take on it. And I wonder, as someone who really does love the history of comics as much as you do, to me it's like Little Annie Fanny, and that's kind of what I told them. I'm like. You guys are doing Will Elder with this, aren't you? I'm like, this isn't, you know, just, uh, am I right? Isn't it Will Elder that was uh, Little Annie Fanny yeah, Playboy yeah. and stuff? That, yeah, to yeah, me, yeah. that's, she. they really kind of repurposed her currently in the comics to kind of, you know, have that kind of, like, you know, just as Little Annie Fanny was kind of just Elder's take on, you know, a, a fun take on modern society and everything. I think he, they've kind of placed Harley in that same position. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and the thing about Harley, even, uh, you know, when I was doing her, it was very clear that she was so, um, she was so comfortable in her own skin. She, she, she could walk into any situation and she seemed to fit in. So if you send her into outer space, it didn't phase her. If you send her back in time, it didn't phase her. She is always, uh, she always kind of accepts what's going on around her and just moves on, you know? So, so she's really adaptable that way. Very cool. Have they collected your Harley stuff? Yeah, yeah, and in fact, uh, right now they're collecting uh, the first eight issues that Terry and I did together, and Rachel, his wife Rachel, who's an amazing anchor. Indeed. Um, they're going to collect the first eight issues in some sort of deluxe hardcover. Terry and Rachel uh, have just finished penciling and inking a brand new cover, which uh, I, I, they, I saw just today in my email, and it's beautiful. That's excellent, man. No, I'm glad, and I and that's uh, I, I'm I'm sure that they are, you know. Smart enough to realize, let's re-release all, all the Harley, the you know the great Harley stuff that we have, and that's the cool thing. You guys, you know, had a had a had a good run, and certainly, you know, Deanie over the years with his various specials and things. So uh, I'm glad I'm glad that uh, the old stuff is getting uh, another uh, yeah. run around the bend, just like uh, the new stuff. Yeah. very cool. Well, I, I I would have to say, you know, to this day, to this day, I have never seen an animated episode that had Harley in it. So I, I've never seen her in that incarnation. Um, when they approached me, they said, we want to do a Harley Quinn monthly comic. Would you be interested in, in uh, pitching for it? I did have to put together a pitch. And I was thrilled because I thought Mad Love was one of the best comics of the decade. Totally. I, thought it, I thought it was so perfectly done. And um, I just said, if I can play in that sandbox, count me in. That's awesome. Man. No, you know, and you, you clearly get your characters. I mean, that's, I mean, and yeah, obviously that's the key to, to getting a gig, but no, that's the thing. I really think that you, you know, especially, and it's funny, I was just talking to Frank Barberi, recorded a conversation with him today. And when it comes to mainstream comics, it, it is that delicate balance of bringing something new, but also working with the familiar because I, right. I, that there's that audience expectation you know, and and in the crassest terms, I've likened it to fast food, where it's like, you know, you don't go to McDonald's and expect to get, you know, steak tartare. You're going, right. you're going for a McDonald's experience. But you want some, you know. I, but I also think, like I said, you got to bring something new, and that's what that's what makes make people really stand up and go, oh no, this guy really gets the character and is bringing something different, or a girl, you yeah. know. So that's yeah. that's the trick. I think, yeah, and you know, there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know. A McDonald's experience, but you can have bad McDonald's experiences too. You know? I, I mean, I've had some. I've had some fine McDonald's experiences, but I've had some very bad ones too. And it's the same with comics. You're absolutely right. It's the same with comics. That's cool. So tell me, among your Marvel work, uh, we mentioned a little bit about the Fantastic Four and everything, and then working with Ringo and, and Mark on the on the on the Fantastic Four run as an anchor. But uh, talk to me about and I and I do remember this. The uh, the lost in in air quotes Captain America comic strip from the forties. Uh, that's one of my favorite projects I've ever done in my whole career, uh, <laughs> because I, you know, as we've said, I'm a huge fan of the old adventure comic strips, and there was just some point I'm not sure how it hit me, but I thought, you know, there was a Superman comic strip in the forties, there was a Batman comic strip. There was a there was a Wonder Woman comic strip in the forties. There was never a Captain America comic strip. If there ever was a character who should have had a daily comic strip in the forties, it was Captain America. And uh, I it was probably the easiest 
concept I ever got approved at Marvel. I mentioned it, mentioned it to Brevoort, and uh, within days I'd gotten the green light. <laughs> and uh, the concept uh, uh, was originally that it would appear online first daily and then be collected into first – uh, what, what ended up being three floppies and, and then eventually into a small trade paperback. And uh, I was I was writing, penciling, and inking it myself, which I loved. But uh, I, I will admit I fell very far behind on the deadline, so I'm sure it did not appear daily online. But uh, but we did get out the floppies and uh, with some beautiful covers by Je- uh, B- Butch Geis. Beautiful. Oh, that's covers. great. And uh, and to this day, it's you know I. Kind of just channeled my my Kniff and some Simon and Kirby. I actually spent uh, a number of days uh, looking at the original Simon and Kirby Captain Americas and redrawing in my own style some of their panels and going, "Wow, Kirby made Cap really lanky," you know. Oh, interesting. And, <laughs> and and in fact, I, I actually did a sample uh, of what the comic strip would look like and sent it to Brevoort, and he said, "Make Cap a little less lanky," because <laughs> that's. He was long limbed, believe me. Well, to be but, as acrobatic uh, as he was and everything too. Yeah, you know. But like I said, I was trying to capture that that Kirby stretchiness sure. that was in the art back there. So, um, but uh, but I mean, in, in many ways, you know, that was my love letter to adventure strips. Um, uh, and uh, I was you know, thrilled to be able to get to do it. I could have kept doing that for a long time. I, I knew what the next story was going to be and everything. But uh, you know, I. I I have to assume sales did not warrant a sequel. Well, so, I, you know that's too bad. And was it was it around the time of the first movie, or um... I think I think there's some correlation with the movie on Foggy, but yeah, I I believe they were interested in getting a, a, a number of Cap projects out there because of the movie. Yes, makes sense. And I man, I remember two uh, late '90s or early 2000s um, that Flash animation uh, Cap series that was online oh. too. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I understand, and yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge, I'm a huge Captain America fan. Now, I also noticed that you you had a run on Daredevil of of eleven. Did you do about a year of Daredevil? Uh, yeah, a year, maybe maybe fifteen issues. I can't remember exactly. All right. What? But yeah, it was. It was yes, I did with Carrie Nord uh, as the artist. Oh wow, Carrie Nord too. That's really cool, man. So yeah. was this okay. literally right before Kevin Smith's run and everything, or? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little foggy on when his rent, oh, this was, this happened right at, and then during the, uh, the, the, the when Image got some of the, the Marvel books, when they got the Avengers and Captain America oh, and stuff, okay. and, and all the heroes, and all the heroes disappeared from the Marvel Universe, yes. um, that was exactly when I was writing Daredevil, because I, I dealt with some of the fallout in that, um, so I'm not sure where Kevin Smith falls, if he's before or after that. Was he in the, um, was he in the gray suit, or was he in the red suit still? He was in the red suit, and I will say uh, Bob Harris uh, had uh, offered me the gig very specifically saying they wanted to return Daredevil to his swashbuckling roots. They wanted him to be funny and yeah. you know, ac- acrobatic and, you know, and that was, of course, an approach that I uh, had no problem with. I really enjoyed that Daredevil myself. I mean, I still have my old Gene Colan Stan Lee Daredevil's with uh, Matt and Mike Murdoch. Swing and Mike Murdoch, the, absolutely. The grooviest guy in the world, absolutely. <laughs> that was one of the most inspired lunatic storylines <laughs> ever. It was wonderful. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, man. No, I no, and it's and that's why when when Wade and Somni and Pablo, uh, Pablo Rivera really kind of brought that fun swashbuckling you know era back and everything it was like oh yeah i remember this guy and, and it was yeah. fun and i hey man love the miller stuff love the bendis and brew baker and and uh, kevin smith stuff too uh and i get it and he and i mean he is great for noir you know street level stories and stuff but yeah i mean there was it, it's like it was a pleasure to see daredevil enjoy himself again so i i yeah. can understand <laughs> no and, and quite you know quite honestly i um you know, I, I enjoyed writing Daredevil a lot. I'm really glad I got a chance to do it. I personally never felt it quite clicked the way I wanted it to until I saw Mark Wade's Daredevil. That was the Daredevil I wanted to do. And, of course, Mark's a much better writer than me. And I I 
love every page that Mark did with Daredevil. It is so perfect on on note, everything. That's cool. And he was working with great artists like Chris Somney and, and stuff, so... And not that I was working with, with Chopped Liver, no, but... No, Kerry Nord, Jesus, uh, yeah, no, I'm a big fan. And, and, and I will say, highlight of my career, one of my issues of Daredevil, drawn by Gene Coleman. That's terrific. So, that is great. Yeah. I had the pleasure, uh, very... I, I, I caught him very late, near the end and everything, but... God, what what a what a sweet man! And I actually, and I'm looking at it now. One of my one of my proudest uh, commissions was uh, he did a blade for me. Uh, back, nice, yeah, back in uh, 2008. And uh, nice. oh God, it's it's gorgeous. And it was that that wonderful period at the end too, when he really got into, as he said, painting with pencils, and just the way right. he you know really worked with with pencils. And uh, Mike Grell is another guy like that too, that I think you know goes beyond. You know the simple pencil yeah. line and shading and and everything that he did, and it's you know it's yeah I love and it's really classic 1973 blade. So it really is Stevie Wonder as Blade, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> truly. No, yeah, that's great. That's beautiful. So that's great, man. No, I I I I am glad that you had that experience because yeah one one of the one of the greats, you know. I mean, you yeah, know, and, and also just yeah like I said, just a a sweetheart of a guy too. Yeah. So very cool, man. And also, I'm interested in this 2011 Hulk Human Torch story uh, because I, I I'm a big uh, certainly it was it was drawn by Steve Ditko in the 80s and I guess plotted by uh, Jack Harris, a, a great writer for Jack Harris. yeah, who uh, you know I know did great work for DC and Marvel and everything. And again, I think you might have been the right guy uh, to kind of flesh it out and, and script it and everything because you know you, you again you you get these characters and stuff. So tell me tell me about working on that story. Well, that one came out of nowhere. Brevoort said that they were trying to clean out the, the vaults a little bit, and they had this story that uh, Jack Harris had uh, written and that Steve Ditko had done layouts for, and it had been shelved for, for whatever reason, and he wanted uh, me to ink it, and he wanted me to re-dialogue it so that um, it maybe sounded a little more modern. Uh, it, there was there was a few plot points that I, I felt were a little muddy, and... Um, so uh, so that's what I did. And um, I had a lot of fun writing it. I, I've always enjoyed the Human Torch as a character. And uh, I really enjoyed working with Steve Ditko. That was I, – I have to admit, when I started working on him, I, I, working, with, working on his layouts, I was going, wow, I think I'm more influenced by Steve Ditko than I realized because I, I kept seeing similarities in my own pencil work, which, you know, there's not a lot of it – not a lot of it out there. But um, – there, there's a certain stylized mannerism to his work that I can really relate to. That's it. You so. know, yeah, I'm, I, I'm interested in this because um, now you, I'm assuming, did you have to do this without his help or and really kind of yeah. crack the Rubik's Cube yourself, basically? Yeah, I mean, I was just given all of the raw materials and then set loose, basically. That's cool. So. No, that's interesting. And yeah, I, I think would be a fun artistic challenge and uh, yeah, I, th- I think that's great. I do remember when it was coming out a few years ago and everything, so pretty neat. Yeah. I, after that got done, I, I told Brevoort, I said, you don't have a, a Sal Buscema story sitting in the vaults, <laughs> do you? I'd kill to work over Sal Buscema. I can understand that. I so, can totally appreciate but, that. Yeah, that was almost like a, like almost a Marvel fanfare kind of throwback, uh, them taking that story and, and giving it to you and getting you to, getting to flesh that out, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. So, no, that was a lot of fun. I've been lucky. I've had a lot of fun assignments laying on my desk. I can't complain. That's awesome, man. Well, now I know the full fo- focus now is on Section Zero. And, uh, you know, I, I again, you're about halfway through the campaign, uh, both in days left, because there's less than two weeks left, and uh, you're yeah. about halfway in terms of uh, reaching your, uh, your goal as well. Um, yep. When, when, you know, this, and, and believe me, I know how long a Kickstarter campaign can take. Uh, who, uh, who are your Kickstarter godfathers? Who'd you go to to get advice on, uh, how to do this right? Well, um, I will say I, I, uh, went to a local guy named Mike Hall, who's done some Kickstarters for uh, games he's designed. Okay. And, uh, Mike is a guy, he lives here in Portland, um, 
and I just started noticing, you know, he, he and I, were, you know, he, he had asked to be my friend on Facebook and, and uh, I did not know him at all. But when I started seeing his posts, I realized we had a lot in common. He, he did a lot of like Indian cooking. I like to do cooking and the sort of movies he was mentioning were the sort of movies I like. And uh, so, you know, he, he became not just a Facebook friend, but very quickly became a friend of mine. And, uh, when I decided to, to go in on this Kickstarter, he gave me a lot of advice on what to do, what not to do. Look, you know, look out for this, you know, blah, blah, blah. He, uh, he was my, my first resource. In addition, uh, there's a number of people, uh, in the studio that I belong to that have done kickstarting campaigns. Uh, Erica Moan, uh, who is actually right now, she, she has her own book on Kickstarter. And, um, Dylan McConus, who'd also done some Kickstarter work. They were really uh, invaluable in giving me some lessons. I talked to uh, John Bogdanov, who has a uh, Kickstarter that did not succeed. And I talked to him about what he thought worked and didn't work. You know, I talked to um, Craig Rousseau. He and Todd DeZego had done a Kickstarter for their Perhapanauts book, and it had succeeded. Um, I talked to Gail Simone, who had a phenomenal Kickstarter, raised over $100,000. Um, talk to her uh, about how that worked for her. How you know? Sure. I, I tried to pick the minds of everyone I could think of, um, and I tried to go into this as fully informed as I could. And, and quite honestly, I'm, uh, uh, even even with all of that, there were things I'm still learning on the job. So to oh, speak. I'm sure. No, definitely. What's uh, which studio are you with right now? Uh, it used to be Periscope Studio in Portland, but now it's Helioscope Studio. Sure. Okay, and Parker's there, and uh, Colin Coover, Parker's right? There's- yeah, yeah, yeah. Colleen Coover, Colleen, yeah. Uh, Paul, Paul Tobin, a lot, of, uh, yeah, yeah. a lot of great people. Ron Randall. Excellent. Um, so it's a, it's a really great bunch of people. They're very, ta- very, very, very How talented. How come the name and, uh, I believe there was uh, a another Periscope organization that actually had a previous claim on the oh, name okay. and uh, sent us a cease and des- desist order. Oh, wow. All right. That's cool. I, you know, yeah, no harm, no foul. Heliscope's a yeah. good name. <laughs> that's yeah, cool. yeah. No, that's great because, yeah, Parker is kind of was my envoy into talking to some uh, Periscope people and everything. And is, uh, right. is Steve um, – oh, bless it. Bless it uh, Steve did uh, White Out with uh, Rucka and he did uh, – Yeah, Steve, Steve Lieber, 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 of course. And his yeah. wife. Yes, Sarah. Sarah. Yes. Very cool, man. No, they're they're great too. So – like yeah. I said, man, no, I know, I know my Portland peeps. That's that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool, man. Definitely. That's excellent. Well, listen, I, I wish you a lot of luck on Section Zero. It's uh, again, it's in wonderful hands. Tom Grumman and Carl Kiesel, and uh, I, I think it, I think it looks great. If you go to their Kickstarter page, we'll give you a link at uh, on wordballoon.com when we post the show. Uh, I appreciate. Absolutely, man. No, check out the video and uh, check out the preview pages that are right there, and uh, I think you're going to find. Uh, a lot of things that you'll you'll want to bid on, and you'll want to help these guys out, and uh, let them realize their uh, their book, and and hey man, get a get a first copy and stuff. When when this is done, do you have some uh, things uh, cooking? And I don't know if you're able to talk about those things or not. Well, I mean, you know, we're hoping that our next project will be Section Zero, Zero. and, uh, and uh, if if that is if that if we can make this work. Uh, I would like to do something like this, you know, maybe not Section Zero, but some sort of kickstarted creator-owned project every year. I would love to do That's that. That's great. And, you know, I would love to make that my primary uh, focus every year, quite honestly. Um, so we're, that's my goal. That's what I'm working towards. Uh, I'm sure it will not be uh, a smooth road. I'm sure it won't be a straight road. I'm sure there'll be a lot of detours. But um, that's that's kind of my five-year plan here. Okay. No, I understand, man. Hey, uh, believe me, in a, a in a broadcast slash podcast sense, I understand, and I'm facing the same opportunities and challenges and stuff. So I uh, I, yeah. I hope this works out. Hey man, you're uh, you guys are uh, you know uh, already well established uh, creators in the biz, and uh, you know DC and Marvel fans certainly are aware of your work, and I think uh, should absolutely uh, check out this Kickstarter and uh, support your creator own stuff, man. I, I'm glad that you guys are thinking that way. Because uh, I, 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 it's you know, it's good to be able to control your destiny, if possible, and everything. It is, it is, you know. And I've had a lot of fun working on Harley Quinn, working on Superman, working on Fantastic Four, and uh, I wouldn't say I would never do those again because they have I have great uh, 
emotional attachment to those characters. Um, But there's a lot of stories that I would like to do that are mine or that are mine and Tom's or, you know, mine and some other uh, artists that I've talked to over years. And um, we we need a place for those two. Agreed. Absolutely, man. No, I uh, I wish you guys luck. It's uh, Section Zero, and it is uh, it, it's uh, again. I'll have the, the link for you guys on uh, on Kickstarter, and uh, it's uh, real you know real real people going after the uh, monsters, lost worlds, UFOs, and uh, all the other challenges of uh, known and unknown uh, to 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 yes, for, unknown, for, for that's to, right. uh, to not screw with copyright infringement. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, one of our one of our uh, taglines for the team is they protect mankind from everything that doesn't exist. <laughs> That's excellent, dude. A pleasure talking to you. I'm finally I'm glad we had this opportunity. And uh, uh, it's been my pleasure. And, John, and, all and please, you know, come back and uh, we'll we'll talk again. I will do that in a heartbeat. Fun reminiscing, man. We really got into some interesting stuff, Carl Kiesel. Uh, and it was a pleasure having him on, and I, I look forward to having him on again to delve further into his wonderful career. I hope you enjoyed today's Word Balloon. It was brought to you by InStock Trades at InStockTrades.com. There's some really neat books that are available now at InStock Trades, likely to support the movie, and I loved it, by the way. Uh, Marvel Universe's Guardians of the Galaxy Digest. Uh, that's uh, Joe Caramanga doing the writing and uh, lots of artists doing uh, the stuff uh, as far as the art goes. Uh, this is uh, Marvel Universe's Guardians of the Galaxy Collection 17 through 19 and uh, material from the first arc of uh, Marvel Universe's uh, Gar- Guardians of the Galaxy 1 through 4. Good all ages stuff, 112 pages in this digest. It's 45% off, just $5.00. And forty nine cents, pretty neat stuff, man. You can get uh, Superman, Wonder Woman, uh, Pete Tomasi, one of the best uh, Superman writers in a, in a very long time. This is still the uh, New Fifty Two continuity, uh, Volume Five, Savage End, is what it's called, and uh, it's uh, of course uh, you can tell from the title that's uh, Wonder Woman and Superman facing uh, the immortal Vandal Savage. Uh, Doug Monkey doing the art. I love Doug, man. He has not been on Word Balloon other than. A couple uh, floor interviews, and I saw him in New York. And seriously, I, I just what a good guy, a uh, good Midwest Greek guy. How can I not like him? And uh, you know he'll be he'll be on Word Balloon soon, man. If uh, his, if his schedule allows, because it's long overdue for me to really sit down and have a great talk with Doug Mackey. Get this book; it's forty two percent off, eleven dollars and fifty nine cents. And aren't they doing a wonderful job in the DC Rebirth uh, Superman uh, books as well? Good, good stuff, man. I, I can't uh, can't praise those guys enough. Devin Grayson, new uh, new graphic novel. Is that right, or is this something old? Uh, this is user. I think this is old. Um, yeah, it is. This is a, a, Vert- a Vertigo mini series that they did. Uh, it explores sexual identity and online role playing in the text based MUD of the nineties. I have no idea what MUDs mean, man. I, I, I guess I wasn't playing that stuff. But what uh, what a wonderful. Um, our team of John Bolton and Sean Phillips and, and Devin Grayson doing the writing. Pretty neat. Uh, this graphic novel is 42% off, and it's just $17.39. You can get Invincible, Kirkman, Volume 11 for the hardcovers, The Ultimate Collection, Kirkman and Ryan Otley doing what they do best. Uh, this is 304 pages for this uh, volume, and it's 42% off, $23.00. And nineteen cents. My best about Robert Kirkman. I I don't think I've seen him face to face. You know, I, like from a distance at a few uh, San Diegos. But it's probably been a year or so since I've actually been able to say hey to him. So uh, we got to try and get him back soon. How about the Flash trade paperback volume two, Speed of Darkness? Joshua Williamson, another guy that I get to get on soon. Kicking ass on DC's uh, Flash Rebirth. And uh, really, uh, as we're as we're recording this. Uh, the final chapter of The Button came out, his crossover with Tom King. Tom is coming up very soon on Word Balloon in the next couple of weeks. We've already kind of penciled that in, depending on his schedule. I'm sure we'll find time and you'll hear him soon. But got to get Josh on as well. And, uh, man, uh, George Corona is doing the art on this. And uh, this book uh, collects uh, Flash uh, 9 through 13. It's 42% off. It's just $8.69 from InStockTrades.com. Go check it out yourself. And I bet you can find some Carl Kiesel stuff over there as well at great prices. InStockTrades.com. 
Thanks a lot for listening to, the, to today's Word Balloon. Next issue, or next issue. Well, you know, I think issue or episode works when you're talking about comic book conversations. Next episode is already in the can, and I've got a couple uh, interviews lined up for early uh, this coming week as well. Have a great weekend. We're in the midst of May, and I think uh, May continues uh, the wonderful conversations I've been having in April, and uh, the intent is to finish out the month strong and also roll right into June with great guests as well, first-timers and return friends. And I can't wait to share it with you, as always. Thanks a lot for the support. Uh, really, as always, uh, you, you guys are the best. And I, I really appreciate you being there and listening each week to these conversations. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2017.